Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Scroll Podcast brought to you by the Adventure Archive. My name is Ryan. And unfortunately, I'm just Hunter. Unfortunately. Um, so today, uh, on this episode, uh, we're going to be talking about a very interesting OSR-style game, 17th Century Minimalist, um, put out by, I believe it's Andre Novoa and um, Games Omnivorous. Because uh, for those that don't know, Games Omnivorous is a Portuguese publisher, um, and I believe the the writer of 17th Century Min- 17th Century Minimalist is also Portuguese. So that'll Very be interesting. Cool. I would I would love to show you a physical copy, um, but there was only 500 ever made, and I didn't I didn't get one. So <laughs> I, don't know. I. I don't know um, if we'll ever get well, one. Although if you did watch our creator cut, um, if you have watched our creator cut previously uh, from this past week with uh, John Davis of Helm, Civid uh, Sanctum. Uh, we actually ran um, Clusterfuck In, which is a uh, module for uh, this game. We did run it in Helm, but it was made for this game. And I, and I think yeah. it was very enjoyable and a cool idea. So It was super fun. Also, it was interesting died. to be in a historical setting because I think we all play these like pseudo like medieval games, but like very rarely are they like, you're in Italy, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah I forgot. Like that's an option for a game. You can be in a real world with, setting. With King George, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Spaniards. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so yeah, so watch that's what episode. we're going to be going over today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go watch Creator Cuts episode two with John Davis. Um, but prior to that, um, we are going to be talking about we're going to do our spotlight for the day, um, and it is a really cool thing you can get right now. To preface this a little bit, we've talked a little bit recently about um, Merkborg. Love the fuck out of Merkborg. It's going to be one of my favorite games forever. We did talk recently about, though, that there's just a lot of stuff out there. There's just a lot, right? Um, Some of it's fucking fire. Some of it exists, and that's fine. Um, (laughs) But um, (laughs) uh, one of the things we want to talk about, a great, great, great friend of the show, Eco from the Lost Bay. Um, uh, They were actually going to come onto the show today. It was going to be a special secret surprise. Never told Hunter about it. I didn't even know. I got excited for something it didn't even happen now it was gonna happen unfortunately uh where eco is it's four o'clock in the fucking morning um and we weren't quite able to make that happen i would still like to talk about this project though and i'm gonna lead with the trailer for the project actually Ooh, hey we're getting high class here on yeah. the weekly scroll we have, we have if, fucking really... if it were, we've we're tried to play, play audio <laughs> we've tried to no well, let's fucking do it we tried audio before so let's see if this works this time So, uh, for all of you all in podcast land that only heard that only heard that didn't get to see that, I highly I recommend. I'm like, well, it was really cool to Whatever. watch that trailer. Whatever, uh, it's it's cool for for all you you we're, listen. We're, we diversify our audience for you guys in podcast land. Um, it, this is called Wicked Wanderers Winter Bundle, put up by uh, uh, the Lost Bay Studio, Eco of the Lost Bay. Um, it is a, a bunch of amazing, amazing uh, creators. If you listen to our last episode with Marcus Serrano, Spicy Tune RPG, a lot of those same names are going to come up because they're fucking awesome. Um, so uh, I highly, highly re- recommend checking this out. We're going to flip through some of it right now. We're on the Lost Bay. Um, this is $46. This is a, uh entire Merc Borg package for solo play and group play. Um, that you can snag right now. It's in pre-orders until it said in the trailer, but I missed it. I think it's December 3rd, I believe. It's going to, it's either the 1st or the 3rd. Um, we'll go through it. But um, uh, for those in podcast land, again, uh, I would highly recommend uh, actually going to YouTube and watching Lisa's section if you're interested in this, or just go check out thelostbasestudio.com and click on Wicked Wonders. It is a vast array of stuff, 
Um, the first image shows all of it. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, like 14 different things right off the bat. Um, and this is includes, I'm gonna butcher some names, so I apologize in advance. Um, a bundle by Philip, I'm gonna say Teich, Teich, T-E-I-C-H, um, Foresight Studio, Christian Sorrell, who many of you know from Mothership, um, uh, um, Philip Jensen, who you will know from uh, previous Merkborg stuff that we've talked about. Um, Nier, who if you, d they do fucking everything. If you don't follow them on Instagram, you're missing out. Like every other day, they're dropping a new adventure, a new dungeon layer, a new something. The graphic design on it is fucking gorgeous. Um, that's N-Y-H-U-R. They also did Alien Armory, um, which we went over and loved. Um, we did amazing. love that gorgeous book put up by lfosr with that with that um that see-through slip cover oh amazing yeah. and uh alfred valley who we talked about a ton last episode with uh marco um who has done lay on hands who did a thousand empty lights just does amazing solo stuff um definitely want to check all that out it's a Merkborg bundle from all of these amazing fucking people right so um the uh, the kind of the, the lead in paragraph, I'll read it to you. The winter waxes cold, dark and scary. Need something to fight the blizzard? We got you covered. The Wicked Wanderers Winter Bundle comes packed with all the Merkborg compatible content you need to get through the winter. Lose yourself in a vanishing town, explore haunted islands and cathedrals and four mini dungeons with a mythos twist. Fulfill the four three misery with a dice drop map. Conquer a polar bear dungeon. B, it's Skekla. I, I'm sorry, Swedes. Um, and escape from an underground prison. Discover new classes. Fight mycelium NPCs. Read your destiny with a cursed oracle and beware the howling lamb. It's actually 15 items by six international designers with hours and hours of play with your favorite pitch black fantasy tabletop RPG. And it is 15% off retail price during the pre-orders until December 1st and ships out December 16th. So it's done. It's ready to fucking go. You're going to get this in less than a month. Highly, 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 highly That's so recommend crazy. this. That's such a crazy, like, it's done. You're just going to, you're just going to buy it and you're going to get it. I, Cause I'm just very used to like Kickstarters. Maybe. We all, we work through a lot of time. It's like, it could be, you could get it in two months. You could get it in, I, you know, a year and a half. Um, yeah, or so more. yeah, so it's like, yeah, you're going to get this It's pre and pre war right now. It's already made. It's already done. You're going to get it in the month. It's like, Oh, Oh, fuck. Yeah. I'll do this. Are you yeah. kidding? Sick. I can't wait. Um, there are a lot of great images on the page that go through a lot, uh, like each individual piece. Um, and it, also eco great page, by the way, as I scroll through the stuff, the images stay to the left. All of the images are tagged with what they're from. I mean, it, good fucking job, dude. Um, whispers in the darkness. Um, we got 40, 20 swords, which are not plus one, which found sad. it's literally 20 swords that are like cool and not just because they're plus one. Looks really, really dope. Um, <laughs> Papa Mush, look at the art on the cover of that. It's these like very, very trippy mycelium people. Um, just uh, this is Isbjorn. We'll go through uh, through all of that. So if, just clicking through the images. It's very Merkborg. But again, like, and we've talked about this before. It's it's a I love when people take the Johan style and and make it a little bit their own. Yeah, and not absolutely. just copy it, you know, piece for piece. But it looks great. Um, so the cross stitch, uh, going through the the different things. Um, the cross stitch is um is a, a, a you explore a missing town, meet its residents, um, and confront a terrible deity. Forty twenty swords that are not plus one, like I just said. Um, it's about creating swords that are powerful, potential, and dreadful, not just because they're plus one. Um, Mork Fang Cell is a solo prison crawl made to be put in your pocket with a pin and a, and a D6, and hours of pain and suffering. Whispers in the Darkness is a collection of four dark Merkborg adventures that will take you through a weird Lovecraftian trip. It Came from the West is an oracle map for Merkborg, fulfilling the 4-3 misery. You drop the dice on the land and watch it burn. Uh, Papa Mush is a tiny, terrible ruler and his fungal war band for Merkborg, um, <laughs> inspired by the wonderful art of Evelyn Moreau, who's amazing. Um, uh, Pallid Jailer, discover your faraway home, use a unique boon granted to you by your liege and pursue those who would defile the laws of the lands. Um, as the Pallid Jailer, a player class for Merkborg. Um, Ibsjorn um, is a one-page beast crawl for Merkborg. A huge polar bear died in the forest. 
brave villagers investigated it but never returned. And then portents and curses of the Prince of Gorse. A shoe company, heed the omens, beware the howling lamb. This bookmark sized solo tool provides a narical oracle and repercussion procedures for Merkborg. So it looks amazing. Oh, there's a lot of shit for like 46 a, bucks, man. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's wow, crazy. you could, you could like, if you're like, you know, I, I have Merc Borg and I'm looking to run a group, like, here's, here's months of game, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it is. And again, uh, all of these writers are absolutely fantastic um, and uh, very excited to get uh, a lot of their stuff. Again, we talked about a little bit the show. Um, there are certain names that are going to pop up anytime you see something that's like super quality in Merkborg, and these are the names that you're going to find every time. So I highly, highly recommend grabbing this stuff. And, and while I'm here, um, let's also talk about just the Lost Bay shop in general, because they are carrying some seriously fire stuff now. Um, if you actually go to the shop, um, we deal in lead that just came out is on the shop. Miru is amazing. Broken Luck, obviously, since that uh, Ecos thing is on here. And Amnesis is a solo tarot crawl. Lay on Hands from Alfred Valley, which we've talked about a bunch. And the sold out Emil Bovin bundle, which you know I got. Um, I'll be posting pictures of that soon, but that's all about Durf um, and his various supplements. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna doubling up on some Durf stuff just so I can get things like Wizardry I didn't printed. realize that you got that. Why wouldn't? Why? I just I, I don't know I'm 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 very jealous you know. Oh yeah, I'm super hyped about it. Yeah. Holy is that? Yeah. A lift, bro. Um, and you can pre-order Sky Realms on here too. So on top of getting this amazing Winter Wonders bundle, um, I highly re recommend checking out the Eco Shop, um, the Lost Bay Studio Shop, which is continuously. Oh, I, I missed Dumpster Fire, um, which is on here as well. Um, a lot of stuff. It's really, really, really great content. Um, Eco's obviously. Uh, um, which I'm like, curating this um, in, in a very fantastic way. Um, there's a lot of solo stuff on here, which is cool. Um, so definitely come check out a shop. And again, highly, highly recommend checking this Merkborg um, bundle you got going on here. If you haven't played Merkborg before, this is a great place to start. Um, and if you have, this is a lot of solid content um, that you'll be able to uh, add to your current games. So that is our spotlight for the day. It is the Winter Wanderers. Fuck, I'm going to fuck up the name. There's a lot of alliteration. The Wicked Wanderers Winter Bundle on the LostBayStudio.com. Seriously, highly recommend it. Um, Eco's a great friend of the show. It's put out some amazing content. And these are a lot of amazing content creators that are putting out this stuff. So that is that's our spotlight for the day. And that's the episode. See you guys later. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> um, just, a, <laughs> just the spotlight. We're out. Yeah. Uh, man, I should have topped up my coffee. So um, let's kick over. So again, we're going to be talking about 17th century. Um, kick over the main screen real quick. Let's, or, let's, 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 let's do this. Transition. Boom. Uh, 17th century minimalist. Dope game. Very excited. Again, anything Games Omnivorous puts out and makes up 500 copies of is going to be fire. Um, if you don't know a lot of Games Omnivorous, if you haven't checked out their um, Manifestus Omnivorous Adventures, I think there's about I think there's about six of them now. They're gorgeous. There's 10 very specific rules that you have to follow for the Games Omnivorous Adventures, which are really cool. Like there has to be it has to be an Earth. There has to be a, um, um, a big eater. The, the basis is that something is eating stuff. Um, what I love about though is that there's it, it, it can only be two colors, so every one has this like color scheme to it, oh. and it comes with this kind of like um, stretchy. Let me fucking grab one. Um, I know exactly. Show us. Yeah. Um, let me just grab fucking like all of them. Um. So these, let me just kick back to the main window real quick. Just so, just, just a little nod to Games on Members real quick, because these guys are fucking cool as shit. These are what, um, well, so one of them's green. That's why it's disappearing on my green screen. But these are what the adventures look like. They can only be two colors, and they all have um, a very specific theme. As I said, they have to be on Earth, they, and it, it involves a big eater. Um, so a lot of amazing content here. And one of the things, this is Kelvin Green. If you haven't read a lot of Kelvin Green adventures, fuck, you're missing out. Um, but they all come with this like, like bungee, um, uh, bookmark too, which is super dope. 
um, every single one, and it's color coordinated to the colors that they're supposed to be. And again, it's only two colors to the entire thing. So this one's literally just pink and white with a blue bookmark, um, and that's it. And then you can go to a different one that's like black and yellow, and it has this like yellow bookmark. Well, it's like a dark brown. It's a dark brown, like a mustard yellow. Um, so when you go inside, it's literally just those colors. And those are two of the rules. Uh, rule number 10, the secret extra rule or whatever, is um, uh, it can't be in good taste. So it's got to be weird and fucked up and and, and whatever. Um, so anyway, that's Games Omnivorous. So going back to the game read through, um, we talk about that because this is put out by Games Omnivorous. And as I said before, they are a Portuguese publisher um, and the creator of this game. Um, I'm, I know I'm going to fuck it up. Uh, Andre Novoa, that's what I said. Andre Novoa, um, and the artwork by Offworld Bogle Initiative. Um, they put out this historical low fantasy OSR rulebook. <sighs> ba -ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba. So, so getting into it, right? Let's there's get a, into there's it. a there's a big old author's note here, which I love. Talks about why they did the system. Um, it was originally a homebrew system for historical low fantasy settings um, that they kept using at the gaming table. People seemed to have fun with it, so they redesigned it, published it, and put it out um, with uh, with Games Omnivorous. Um, the system is fit for both seasoned players and beginners. Can be used to play quick one shots as it cuts the rules down to their essence and allows character generation under five minutes. It can also be used to play historical campaigns set in Europe. There are swords and daggers and bows, but there are also pistols. You know, to each their own. Classes are based on what you'd expect. We tag as outcasts in early modern Europe, low-life vagrants and vagabonds that wander around as merchants, plague doctors, um, mercenaries, jugglers, or hired assassins jumping across kingdoms and royal courts, entertaining, tricking, and murdering people. There is no magic in this system. The talents of plague doctors can be interpreted as miraculous treatments or folktale. The skills of illusionists can all be explained through mechanics, sleight of hand, and perception, just like a magic trick. Both should be read as make-believe. The following games have influenced the system, some more decisively than others, and I would like to credit them as such. The Black Hack, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Troika, Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells, Dungeon Crawl Classics, and Mothership. I mean, talk about a list for inspiration. Um, yeah. And they, they also hope you enjoy... Um, dope. I love pages like this. Like it's a, it's a really great intro to the game to give you a sense of why this game yeah. exists and how it came about. So really stoked for that. Very um, cool. it, this is a pretty short. Also, this is another great page to have. How is this game different? I love, <coughs> I love this 17th century minimalist has been primarily designed for OSR crowd as it draws extensively from other games in the community, but it has some design choices that make it unique. It's definitely very OSR, NSR. Again, in the future, people that give a shit can 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 designate stuff. I'm leaning more to the realm that OSR is basically retro clones, um, like BX, and that's pretty much it. Yes. Um, yeah. If yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and I love the same lines. Yeah. And then everything else that's kind of uses the concepts of osr but not the mechanics to me is now the nsr which it makes sense and that's what we're going to go with but i feel the know. exact same way and listen if you're if you are listening to us right now and you disagree that's perfectly fine and you can call it whatever you want on your podcast yep you should probably have one because <laughs> all of us fucking mid white dudes have one but um yeah uh, also, uh, comment on, on our YouTube or whatever and let us know um, your opinions on that. Um, but that's the direction that I think things are trending anyway, and um, that's cool. Um, I'm cool, but, you know, I'm not big, like, I'm not a big stickler for naming conventions, honestly. I'm good to roll with uh, roll with whatever works. I don't, yeah. I, 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 I like to give things a definition because then I can settle it into my mind a little bit better. Like I can define and compartmentalize and delineate things like a little bit totally, easier. That totally makes sense. And that's how a lot of people feel. So yeah, this one does lean a lot more OSR than NSR though, as we get through like yeah. the, the, the roles and stuff like that, like <laughs> there, it, it definitely has a much more OSR feel than something like Mark Borg, for example, which I think is like a, a great epitome of like the NSR. Um, but anyway, why is this different? All rules are simplified and compressed to their essence. The whole thing is 44 pages, and, and, and a lot of that stuff is not like the core rules anyway. It assumes historical low fantasy setting in the 17th century, um, which is not like a standard like fantasy, you know, Western, medieval, Tolkien-esque thing. 
Um, it has firearms with flintlocks. Um, it does not have magic. Um, as I, we said earlier, uh, the tricks are illusions and the plague doctor stuff is medicine. That's not really witchcraft. Um, there are beliefs and things like that, but it doesn't exist in the game. So there's no magic, which I think is awesome to do sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think especially for this thing, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, combat is fast, deadly and scary. Um, why? Why is it fast, deadly and scary? And this is the thing I love. And in the game that I'm developing, this is exactly why I do this exact same thing. Hit points are static. Characters do uh, not gain more HP at higher levels. I mean, there's in my game, you can gain like you can marginally, tinyly inches up um, if you survive. But um, that means two things. First, that most players will think twice before initiating hostilities against even the feeblest of adversaries. And second, that everyone knows that unless they're fighting a supernatural creature, all characters have approximately the same number of hit points. This creates great tension and infuses historical probability into the game. Um, and finally, the game rewards those who do what their class is best at, experience-wise, and also gives optional mechanics for reputation. The two together offer opportunities for a more narrative style of play. Right off the bat, you got me. You win me. I love yeah. that these. I love that these two pages are here, um, because that is kind of the early question: is why the fuck would I play this instead of D and D? Well, because D and D sucks. Five E at least. Um, and uh, that's because... our one an episode. <laughs> oh wait, yeah, because it's the same day as every episode. Yeah, it, I probably won't be the last one today, guys. Sorry. Um, how about one D and D not get an OGL? That's the rumor. Mm, excited for that. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Um, anyway, I love this page in general, and I wish more RPGs had this specific page that was like, why play this game instead of a different one? Here yeah, are all the absolutely. reasons. Okay, you got me. You, you won me over here. How to use this book in various ways. Um, that's what it says in the book. Uh, you can create your own adventures. You can write some campaigns. You can run the modules as they appear in the separate mini adventure folder. You can do whatever the fuck you want is basically what it says. It's a minimalist game. Use it as a framework if you want. I know there's some history nerds out there that have are are like would be stoked to play this. Like to have yeah. something set that has magic already cut out. It has like it's it's set up for 17th century. I mean, even I'm like, oh, you could do some like alternate history shit, you know? Like you could do some alternate history uh, shit. Yeah, very cool. I do I do love that it's set. The world reminds me of Fallen a little bit, um, from PR, perplexing ruins, without like obviously without the magic and stuff like that, but yeah. the, the the general kind of setting where it's like, um, it's definitely historical, but like there's probably tricorner hats and shit. Um, definitely, uh, definitely gets me. Um, and I love the 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 little sketchy guys from um, what? Uh, oh gosh, sorry, artist. Offworld Bogle Initiative. They're super simple. Like I said, they're very sketchy. I mean, straight up, looks like they're drawing crayons. I'm into it. Yeah, I'm into it. Um, okay, so uh, again, this is not a long zine. It's 44 pages, and basic rules start on page 8. So we're getting there. Um, and this is where you'll see the OSR kind of feed into a little bit. A lot of the stuff is really based on, was clearly based on um, older editions of the game with some mechanical tweaks that uh, we both really enjoy. So um, it's a role-playing game. One player, we don't need to read this part. It, it explains... <laughs> It's one paragraph on what's an RPG. You roll dice. There's a game master. This is a game of the game master. That's it. Okay. So time is strictly measured when it's only strictly measured when combat or conflict takes place. In such situations, there are um, move, uh, one action and one movement per turn. Love that. Standard. All other events and times are abstracted. Who cares? Um, Who cares? Movement. Yeah. yeah. Movement. movement it's, it's our favorite. Listen, it's our favorite distance measuring ever. It's yep. near, distant, and far away. I'm like, fuck that's yeah, that's, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's all you fucking need. That's really all you need. Um, I, uh, Merkborg did the same thing. I love the way that they describe their rule. It's literally, how far can you move? You can move across a decent-sized room. That's it, and figure I'm it out gonna from be there. Honest, I, now, I now homebrew all NSR, OSR games that have, like, I'm just like, yeah, you can move across the room in, the, in your turn. Like that's that's about it. Yeah. yeah, I think I described I described mine as my distances are near, distant, and far, but I describe them as uh, within a sword swing, within a dagger throw, and within a bow shot. Yeah, yeah, that's all you fucking need. And then yeah. who cares? 
Like, I'm sorry that your character can only run 35 feet instead of 40. God, and it's fucking, I'm, I don't. You're short by five I, I, feet. I, I, I just have so many moments in that fucking game where fun was ruined by five feet. And I'm just like, fucking, just let the fucking thing oh think, bro. <laughs> yeah, let the thing <laughs> think. The fun's going to be ruined, damn it. It's going to be by the dice. <laughs> yeah, as it should be. Not by stupid rules and the people that <laughs> interpret them in stupid ways. Sorry. Not sorry. I'm not. I'm not. The game sucks. Um, so they're used to calculate relative positions. Um, some weapons are only effective when near, while also others are better distant. as a standard for that. Um, again, this is these are the parts of like the more NSR style mechanics that feed into these, you know, somewhat more OSR games that we love. Like just abstraction. Yeah. Just abstraction. Implied. Yeah. You know what? You know what? When it really comes down to what I think the OSR is, it's um, things are implied and abstracted. Yeah, absolutely. Really, a lot of it is. So um, anyway, so actions, simple actions automatically succeed. More complicated actions that have a chance of failure are tested, deciding by rolling a 1d20. The GM narrates the events. Now, d20, what's our favorite d20 roll mechanic? Oh, it's roll under, obviously. Roll under, maybe. Roll yeah. under is a superior, superior d20 it is, mechanic. It's superior. Um, if the roll is on or below the score of the ability being tested, the action succeeds. If it's above, it fails. You know what's great? I think we talked about this before. The great thing about roll under is it removes uh, one level of bullshit, right? Because if you're doing roll over, you roll 3d6 for a stat, and then you have to turn that stat into a modifier. Why? If you do d20 roll under, you just roll 3d6 for a stat and roll under that stat. You, yeah. It's, it, you cut out the middleman. Oh, totally. I mean, I and seriously, man, like, it, you know, I, I talk about that I have a Bastards group because um, we're just running through all Bastards adventures right now. And two of them have never played a tabletop game before ever. And like oh. explain them like D20 roll under. It's like there's no you don't have to do any extra math. You just roll under that number. And they're like, oh, OK. And they immediately got it. I'm like, OK, wow, this is way better. <laughs> Super easy because how to yeah. be like, OK, wait a minute. A 15 is no, because it only goes up by one every odd. Like, sure. When you know, you know, like I know what that is. Like it's it's like it's like having to convert a second language in your head or something like that, like in a very, very minute way. I don't speak a second language. I speak very tiny bit of Spanish. But like that's how it feels is like, why have that extra layer of, of, of stuff when you could just use it as is? It's a, it's it's a superior mechanic. D twenty. If you're using D twenty, which is not my favorite dice roll mechanic, anyway, uh, roll under is superior. Um, all right. Um, advantage and disadvantage. Um, one thing I thought was weird about this page is all all of the headers are red, and this one's black for some reason. But it's like the longest one on the page. So it's not like it's less important. But huh. advantage and disadvantage. Characters can have advantage or disadvantage to perform actions. Again, a lot of the stuff, if you've ever played a game before, yeah. you know it's how advantage. it works. You roll Just two dice, take the higher. Disadvantage, you roll two dice, take the lower. I yep. believe in this one, it does say they cancel each other out in the unlikely event um, that yeah. you have both, right? Yep, yep. Um, yep. In the unlikely event you have both, they cancel out and you just have a regular roll, which, again, is also standard. Yeah. And I don't think if It's any almost like a straightforward logic, you know? It's almost like, again, a lot of this is rooted in BX, and, and that's what OSR yeah. is, with some tweaks. Like, you know, the roll under, I don't think it, I mean, it's obviously not BX. BX is roll over with modifiers and stuff like that. But, again, it's superior. In the event that a character has more than one advantage or disadvantage, he or she rolls three dice and chooses the best or worst result, respectively. This is called a double advantage or double disadvantage. No matter how many disadvantages stack up, the maximum character rolls are three dice. That's it. So 18 advantages, three fucking dice. That's what you get. Um, Abilities. So there are five ability scores so in this. five, not four, as we've been seeing a lot, or three. Or, um, or six. Or six. Yeah, six is too many. Five is interesting because, like, the fifth one is kind of it's, an ability. Yeah, it's so the fifth one is we'll get there, but it's luck. So it's like yeah. it's kind of it's kind of four and luck. Um, four and luck, which I, it was a great, which is great. I love. We yeah, love four. I actually I kind of I'm like I'm seeing that more and more, and I'm really like, oh, okay, I think that works really well for me. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, we love four. Have three stats. I'm like, we could use one more in certain situations, but 
Um, yeah. I like three. I like four. I don't like six. Yeah, no, six too many, bro. It's too much alienation. You don't need it. Like, honestly, wisdom can just be lumped in with intelligence. You know what I mean? Um, it's it, The four they picked on this is interesting, though. So um, every complex action must be tested with the appropriate ability. Um, uh, these will be obvious in most certain occasions. It's basically, yeah, charisma, which is the one I'm like, that's an interesting choice, um, which is influence and leadership used also to persuade, charm, bargain, or hire retainers. Um, the main staff are illusionist dexterity, which is agility, reflexes, ranged attacks. Um, also used to search, disarm traps, pick locks, disguise, all things thief, man to believe a cutthroat. Um, strength, which is physical prowess, endurance, and melee attacks. Used also to break down stuff and lift heavy things, the man to believe a soldier. And intelligence, knowledge, and insight. Also used to assess information, read languages, and discern architecture. The main ability of the plague doctor. And then finally, you have luck, chance, and fortune used to determine the right place, right time, divine favors, and general good fate. It's the main ability of a swashbuckler. So it is used in an interesting way, um, but luck feels like the one that it feels like a little odd man out, um, <laughs> at least in the first read through. Um so searching secret stuff when pcs wish to search for secret things like hidden compartments doors or traps they should not make the roll instead the gm asks about their appropriate ability value usually dex or luck and makes a roll for them behind the screen this prevents the players from knowing if there is indeed a secret thing or if they just had a bad roll the gm must always be true to the dice interesting that paragraph is really interesting because of all the implications that come with it right, right? So that automatically says they would prefer if you didn't meta. Yeah. Right. Um, it also says, please don't fudge your rolls, which is fine. Um, to each their own. I think in 5e, to have a fun experience as a GM, you have to fudge your rolls. You do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's do. the only game I do it in, though. The only game I do it in. Because in 5e, um, the general consensus amongst the community, as I've seen and known, is that it's bad to kill players. Yeah. And people get sad and mad if you kill their player. Um, yeah. Um, and, um, and everything else, it's part of the game. Yeah, part absolutely. So, uh, saving throws. There are no separate values for saving throws. Um, when a character is surprised by a harmful situation, like a trap, the GM will test the appropriate ability. So everything is just test. If the test is successful, the character dodges the situation. Deck strength, charisma, um, dex uh, is area effects, traps, collapsing doors, falling debris. Strength is ingest poison, exposure to acid, gases, disease, charisma, resistance to tricks, witchcraft, and illusions. So I see not intelligence and not luck in those. Which is interesting that they're stats but not saves. Yeah, that is interesting. It's not move the side or anything, huh? Um, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. Like, what do would you see like an intelligence check being? Um, or an well, intelligence thing, save being? Well, I think the difference is this: is that because there are no saves, right? It's it says saving throws at the top, but then it specifically says there are no saves. Everything is tests, right? So even to have this on its own, I don't think, again, that there there are no, since there are no saves, if you need to do an intelligence one, it would just be an intelligence test for whatever it is. I think these are more examples of the things um, than that these are the only three, because again, it says saving throws and that there aren't any. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Um, more, more, of this, more of this cute little art dude jumping out of a flaming tower. Um... Yeah. So combat. When combat takes place, all PCs and adversaries determine the order of combat. Then each one of them may move and take one action in their turn within the round of combat. Um, uh, and you determine that order with initiative. Each, P each PC puts one dice in a bag. Add another dice for the adversaries and one neutral die. The GM takes one of these in turn from the bag. The owner can perform his or her turn. All adversaries act when their die is pulled. If the neutral die is taken, the round ends, um, and a new 
uh, initiative bag is assembled. So uh, turn individual action within a round. Round starts when the first die is taken. Um, what what is what 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 is this? Where where have you seen this before? I wasn't answering a question in chat. Uh, tell me where have I seen it before, Ryan? Dude, it's it's the fucking stack in Troika. Oh. <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah, we love the Troika stack. It's, uh, where Ryan's a massive fan of it and he thinks it's the best system for, uh, um, for initiative ever, right? So being sarcastic, but I think it's an interesting way to do it. I like this way better. Um, it's, it looks, it feels yeah. like a simplified version because in the stack, everybody, everything on the board gets a token. So if you have a ton of players and a ton of bad guys, everything gets a fucking token. In this, the PCs each get one. Well, not only that, and sometimes you can have more than one token for bad guys. So like, yeah, it's true. The, it does get a lot guys. more. This is a lot less. Yes. Involved and complicated than it needed. Yeah. It needs to be. <laughs> yeah. You know? If you have four uh, players, there's only going to be six dice in the bag. One for each player. One total because all the bad guys go at one time, and then the neutral token that denotes the end of the round. So this to me, I I, I like the trigger stack. I think it's very interesting. I think it's very yeah. It, it, I mean, it has interesting aspects to it. Yeah. Yeah, but this feels like a more simplified version. And you know, us as we get older, I I want less rules, and this feels like less rules. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I really do want less rules. Yeah. So uh, to hit uh, to hit opponents, characters test their strength in melee or dex in range. If successful, they inflict damage to their opponent. The amount of damage is determined by the weapon's dice. It's a, it's a game. Um, critical hits and failures. An action is fumbled when a character rolls a d20. The character hits an ally or themselves. If it's not plausible, the weapon breaks. Easy. 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 Um, uh, uh, an action is a critical hit when a character rolls a 1. You add 1d4 of damage to the roll. Plus, adversary can't use armor to prevent damage. Very I cool. I like that. That's a I cool like take. That. It's yeah. not overpowered because this mm -hmm. is like a grittier game. Um, it does give you a little bonus, and you can just avoid armor. Like, I think that's super appropriate for a crit in this. Like, double damage would be, like, needlessly powerful, you know? Yeah. But yeah, a D4 yeah. extra and, and skipping armor, like, or going over armor, like, I think that's that works really well. This. Yeah, because I mean, no matter what, here's the thing, uh, and this is this was one of the the very first rules that I homebrewed in Five E that then found out a lot of other people did. Um, I hate rolling two dice for damage. I hate just rolling one and doubling it. It seems dumb to me because, in my opinion, a critical hit should never be less than what you could do without a critical hit, right? So yeah. what I always did was. You just you roll once, and then if your damage die is a d6, you then just add a d6. So if you roll a three, it's six plus three. So it's always over. This, what's interesting, like you just said, is you could actually end up rolling a two because you're rolling yeah. two dice, but you ignore armor, which I think yeah. is an actually interesting way to do it historically too because these guys didn't have full fucking plate. And even if there's plate, there's under the arms, there's in the groin, there's always places you can hit. I love the narrative that goes into this very simple rule where basically like you don't just ignore armor like you you it seems to me like you 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 just hit a critical spot yeah and you get a little boost so it's a cool way to do you it I really like in this some role. way or another yeah through some yeah. weakness or another you know yeah i really like it so when someone tries to hit a character in melee combat and fails he or she can immediately roll to hit against that same adversary with a melee weapon or with a pistol the roll to hit is made with disadvantage interesting yeah. reading this again when someone tries to hit a character in melee and fails so you get a counterattack on every fail. I love that. Definitely adds to lethality. That's a very, very active combat, you know? Yeah. Really enjoy that a lot. Um, there is armor, and uh, they're European, so they do it the fun way with O-U-R. You um, mean the, the better way spell armor? It is the better way, but I feel like you such You hear that, a... Micah? If you're listening out there, I like it when they use the U in armor. Um, it feels so douchey as an American putting it in there, though. Um, <laughs> if I were to put out a book and then it's just like, oh, you're just from California. Well, Why the murder. fuck do you have you in there? Um, anyway, so there's uh, there's like five different. Um, oh, so there is full plate, but you can still get around it. Um, so there's five different types of armor. There's cloth, which is uh, armor value of one. Leather, which is two. Cuirass, which is three. Cuirass. Uh, full plate, which is four. And a shield and a helmet add one die each. So you can theoretically, if you have full plate, a helmet, and a shield um be pretty pretty stacked 
Um, yeah. Each type of armor grants a number of dice, D6s, equal to its armor value. So it's not like you got a flat number, right? You actually get to roll you a roll. D6 to the value, which is interesting. It's a really interesting mm. way to do it. When a character is hit in combat, he or she may use one of these dice to ignore all damage taken. A die used in this way is set apart and cannot be used again until it is fixed. <sighs> So I don't think you're rolling. I think it's you basically they're just using the dice tokens. tokens. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically you can, if you have up to four tokens, you basically can ignore all armor four times or all, all damage, damage four yeah. times. Yeah. I do like that. That's an interesting way to do it without yeah. having to roll against stuff. It's basically like armor protection, <clears throat> like, a, like a lancer kind of situation yeah. before or something else. Um, shields and helmet give one extra die each, um, use another color, and have an armor value of four for fixing purposes. Um, if fixing fails, they're broken. So that goes directly into fixing armor, because the next question is, wait, fixing armor? How do you do that? Oh, it's right here. Um, after a long rest, PCs can roll and all of the dice set apart. Can roll all of the dice set apart. Those that roll above the respective armor value are considered fixed. Those that roll on or below are broken and must be repaired by an artisan. If all dice become broken, the arm is destroyed. So basically, let's say you have a cuirass, because I just want to say a cuirass. You cuirass. have 3d6s. Yeah, you have 3d6s, and the value is three, right? So if you use in combat all three um, to ignore all damage three times, at the end of the combat, when you're resting, you roll 3d6s. For every roll of four or up, you get that D6 back to use again. Every roll of three or less is just gone, and you have to actually go to a professional to fix it. I like that. Absolutely. It's good. It's good. I like it. Um, armor proficiency. PCs wearing armor that is not listed in their class must add the armor value to all ability tests. Interesting way to do that. So if you can't use a cuirass and you're wearing one, Every time you do a test, you have to add three, which again is roll under, so that's bad. Yeah. yeah. Um very cool. Again, uh I love it's simple, but there's a lot of really interesting tweaks that I really enjoy. Um weapon damage, super fucking easy. Small weapons are D4s, daggers, knives, garrots, small crossbows, medium weapons are D6s, swords, axes, heavy crossbows, your standard weapons, and then big weapons are D8s, they're two-handed weapons. Used with disadvantage by default. You cannot have a shield, and they include long swords, long bows, and pole arms. So, really interesting take on bigger weapons to auto roll with disadvantage for the potential for more damage and no shield. I really like that. Yeah. Uh, damage and hit points. If a character takes damage from an attack, they subtract the value from their total hit points. Right. So when a PC reaches zero, they're taken out of combat, wait for it to resolve, and then roll on the table below. Survivors return with one HP. If the whole party loses the conflict, the PC is dead. Right. So uh, when an NPC or adversary reaches zero, they're just dead. So it's a D6 table. Do you want to roll a D6 or do you want me to drop one real quick? Sure. Two. Unconscious so for D three hours. I'm gonna roll that. I'm out for two hours. Yep. Yeah. So I like that. The only one that really like, if you roll a six, you're dead. Again, it's a roll under system, so you want to stay consistent across all of your tables and everything. Low is good, high is bad. So D six is dead, but five. Um. Or and the stats below that four, you're scarred. You lose one D three charisma. It's just gone. Um. Five, you're maimed. You lose one D three dex or strength. I like that. I'm having them flip a coin for that one. Yeah. Um, hurt uh, for three. Disadvantage on all rolls for the remainder of the session. Cool way to do it. Lasting yeah. injury, but only lasts for the session. Um, and then one, you're just knocked out. You just get up. Everything's cool. You're chilling. Um, distances. We talked about this before. Is this a repeat um, section or is it just in a different section that made it no, necessary? No, it's in a different section, I think. Oh, it's just in the movement section. Yeah. So um, going back to distances, same as before, near, far, and and uh, near, distant, and far. Near, you can use melee, distant, you use range, and far away, only super special things can do that. Um, 
two interesting optional rules here. There's the combat trigger. In tense situation, those when combat seems inevitable, the, G the GM should res refrain from calling initiative. Instead, role play it out. And over a PC or NPC does something dramatic, like shooting a pistol or swinging a blade, they get to do it and technically are granted a bonus turn for having the courage and audacity of starting a fight. The initiative bag should only be assembled after resolving this bonus turn. So basically, if you're the first one to do something, you get advantage on the very first action because you got the balls um, and then initiative starts. And so you could technically, well, you would you would go twice in the first round. I like that. I think that's how I use, do most things. 5e, that's how I do it too. Um, it makes no sense to be like, okay, I shoot him in the face. And then you go, okay, everybody roll. All right, you're last in initiative. Then you can shoot yeah. like, come on. Yeah. Um, grappling is an option. Um, characters can try to grapple one another. To do so, each side makes a strength test. Um, if both win or lose, the action is unsuccessful and wasted. If the attacker alone wins, the defendant becomes grappled and vulnerable to all attacks, taking automatic weapon damage. In his or her turn, the defender can make a strength test with disadvantage to try to get rid of the grapple. Clean, easy way to do it. I really enjoy it. So, um, my favorite section, if you know me very well, um, firearms. Firearms are used by testing decks. I'm being sarcastic. I don't like guns. Um, yeah, before yeah, firing the I weapon. I mean, you got it. I just want to make sure the podcast knows that um, I don't like guns in my games. Um, interesting mechanics here, though. Um, you roll, uh, you test decks. Um, and before firing the weapon, the PC must roll for misfire. If the firearm does not misfire and it's successful, the PC may inflict weapon damage on the adversary. I think it's really interesting that you roll misfire first. Um because of what happens afterwards you basically don't have to it, uh, it's just it doesn't make a difference but it's interesting firearm takes a number of rounds to reload equal to 18 minus a character's dexterity okay 18 more okay so the max you can roll on 3d6 um for stats which is what you roll does it ever actually did i roll over that part does it ever say in stats that you roll 3d6 for stats oh no i'll go back and check real quick but i would it assume doesn't. it's 3d6 yeah but... yeah but yeah it's i mean it's osr so it's probably 3D6. oh you know we haven't hit character creation that is next couple pages gotcha so um 18 is a max you're gonna have so unless you roll max like, if you have, like, a 15, it's going to take three rounds to reload it. If you rolled an 8, it's going to take 10 rounds to reload it. I do like that, because I don't um, like... Um, it's uh, 3d4 for each ability. No, uh Is it 3d4? Yeah, it's 3d4. Oh, they really make the, you weak boys. Yeah, so, the high I mean, is 12. So, at, at max, it'll be six rounds. So, the odds are, if you fire a gun, you're probably not going to fire you're another firing gun. It, you're firing it, and then you're doing something else for the rest of the well, not only that, say that you get maimed at some point and you permanently have like a minus one D3 to your shit. Like it's going to be you're literally basically going to do what other games have done where you fire your gun once, drop it and then fight. Yeah. And I like that. That's a much better way than like 5e where you can create builds where you fire 18 times in one round and shit. So on a misfire, you roll a D10. Um, one to eight is a nice shot. Good job. A nine is a misfire. The firearm doesn't shoot and it's the action is wasted and then you might have six rounds before you can fire again and a 10 is a backfire and it causes the damage to the user instead again i love that um optional rules for damp places um that actually misfires on a seven to nine instead of just on a nine um which i like because this flint lock your shit's dry um damage and distance firearms ignore cloth armor Bumbles and critical hits work as in regular combat. Um, to simplify, there are two types of firearms, pistol, pistols and muskets, and that's it. Um, both use D8 damage, um, but pistols can be fired near or distant, and muskets um, can be fired uh, distant or far, but far away is disadvantage. Easy. Like, such a simple rule set, dude. I, it's so yeah, enjoyable. Very much. Very sure. Um, firing mechanism. The flintlock is used as the default firing mechanism, and if the GM wants to introduce further his historicity, it is possible to use other mechanisms. There's a match lock and the wheel lock. Um, match lock, um, the price of the weapon is in half. Reloading increases by three rounds, and you always roll on the damp table. And wheel lock, the price of the weapon is doubled. Reloading time increases by four rounds, but does not backfire ever. Um, and only misfires on a 9 to a 10. Um, explosives, uh, they can be thrown at distant adversaries by testing decks due to their instability characters always roll with disadvantage 
Success, it lands where you want, causes D10 damage um, to all targets near. Unsuccessful, the grenade lands in an unintended area. Um, and a fumble, the grenade goes off in your hands, does D damage to you and anyone near you. Um, th there's a whole table of rare firearms we're not really going to dig through, but they're interesting. Um, just for example, there is a uh, an axe pistol. So it nine, misfires nine on a barreled musket, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nine barrel. Nine. Yeah. Um, so on this table, there are misfires, damage, and descriptions. So axe pistols, uh, you roll on the normal misfire table. The damage is 1d8 or 1d4. Um, and the pistol has an embedded axe head. So you fire for 1d8, you hit with 1d4. That's dope because you fire once and then you just start hitting with a fucking axe. Yeah. That's cool. Bayonet, blunderbuss, flintlock, uh, hand mortar, heavy musket, you know, lots of stuff. It's interesting. Um, so now for the character creation section, this is for the players. Um, the uh, For character creation, like you just said, you roll 3d4 for each ability. Charisma, deck, strength, 3D4. intelligence. 3d4, you suck. 3d4, <laughs> yeah. Which I like historically. You're not yeah, gods. That totally makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Reroll all of the abilities with a score of five or less using 1d4 plus 12. That's interesting. Because you could get to 16 there. So you it's could. almost good to just roll bad and then... Six. And then backtrack. What? What's up? What'd you say? I said, yeah, you roll roll bad, then backtrack and re-roll, you know? But wait a minute. If you roll 3d4... But for every ability under five, you roll one d four plus twelve. You can get sixteen. Yeah, yeah, you could. And the minimum you could get is thirteen, which is higher than you could get for three. You're probably gonna really suck at a couple things and be okay ish at a couple. Things. Yeah. So if you roll really bad, really, you'll um, you'll, you'll be saved. Uh, There's a built-in save. That's not just yeah. you dying and making a new character. Yeah. Um, if the character ends up with no ability above 10, return to the step above and reroll abilities once again. Choose a class, Cutthroat, Illusionist, Plague Doctor, Soldier, or Swashbuckler. So again, there's one class for each ability, which I love because it feeds into your scores, <clears throat> keeps people kind of in their lane. Um, register the maximum hit points as listed in the respective class section. So again, hit points are static throughout the game. You don't gain more when you advance levels. It just is what it is. Um, note down the starting equipment, uh, read and study the special abilities, and keep going. Luck is where it's explained here. Luck can be expanded during the course of play. A PC can burn one point of luck permanently, permanently, to reroll any failed ability test except for fumbles. A fumble's always okay. a fumble. Yeah, at the end of, it's at, just gone, though. That's your it's just dead, gone. Dead, it's just gone. Um, at the end of each adventure, or whenever the, the GM deems fitting, PCs can gain back 1d3 of luck up to their original value. So it's gone. You can slowly get it back, but you'll probably never be full again. Um, resting and healing. There are two types of rest, long rest and short rest. The long rest, um, everyone gets all their hit points back on a short rest. PCs heal one hit point per level. That's it. Um, PCs need to make a long rest at least six hours per day. And if they don't, you get disadvantaged on all rolls until you do. Um, usage die is something we love. We saw in Fallen. We did um, see it Fallen. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. about that. Interesting way to use it here is <laughs> ammunition arrows rations torches any consumable that um might that you could run out of you start with d12 um and you use uh usage dies to go down so um basically after you've used something you roll the die you're on so if you're on a d12 you roll a d12 if you get a one or a two it goes down to a d4 again you roll that again goes down to a d8 d64 i think we we tested this before i tried to pretend to do math and roll it out i think on a d12 you average about like 30 ish uses um before you'll uh before you'll be depleted it's respectable um, yeah uh language pc is another native tongue and those are the kingdoms close to theirs and they come across an exotic dialect they make an int check, uh, int test with the disadvantage to determine whether they're proficient in it or not dead languages are tested with double disadvantage PCs can never roll for the same language twice. So once you realize that the French are not Spanish, um, uh, you know you <laughs> he never, don't. He never realized. Yeah. Um, these are some interesting just like extra rules and stuff. So food PCs must consume at least one ration of food per day and drink in a portion of water. So there's a list basically of, of the five days where if you don't do things, it gets worse. 
Day one, disadvantage on all rolls. Day two, disadvantage on all rolls. Day three, double disadvantage. Day four, double disadvantage, plus you lose hit points. Um, day five, double disadvantage. At the end of the day, you die. Um, hunting and foraging. Um, there are hunting and foraging rules ba with modifiers based on different areas, like deserts and swamps and stuff like that. Um, and you can test decks or luck. Um, and uh, you get a usage die on a success. So... In the jungle, you start with a D10, you to die, and that's your rations. Um, there are encumbrance rules. You know, I love me a good inventory system. You do love um, a good inventory system. You carry a number of items equal to your strength. Easy peasy, because you're not using a modifier. Carrying more items means you are overburdened. Each type of consumable takes only one slot. Armor and main weapons do not count. All other items count, including other weapons. Um, very large items take up more slots. So on your inventory, PC should list down the items in the inventory in the order of their choosing in the character sheet. The lower the score, the easier it will be you to retrieve the item. Um, retrieving items when PCs wish to retrieve an item in a hurry from their bags during conflict or combat, they must roll 1d10 and score equal or higher than the item's position in the inventory. If the roll is successful, they can use the item in the same turn. If the roll is unsuccessful, the entire action is wasted. I love that rule for pulling yeah. stuff out of your inventory. Um, and being overburdened, a PC must add plus two to every ability test for each extra item they're carrying. So don't do it. Um, moving into campaigning. Um, it is, is possible it, this to is use... All, so this next two sections are very much like almost the game master's section. You mm -hmm. know, they give it yeah. for how to run, like how this game should be run in its format of like, it kind of seems like a short campaign. You know? Yep. Um, yeah, but I mean, also, uh, the game assumes a maximum level for five. So once you hit five, you're yeah, done. Yeah, you're done. That's it. And it's a clean system, so there's no reason not to. Um, and we'll just breathe through some of these sections, too. Because So um, experience PCs gain a level for every 10 points of XP. All classes gain points for surviving adventures and reputation-changing deeds. The GM decides how many points these are worth, usually between two and four. Then each class gains additional points for performing in-character feats. The feats below are merely indicative, so things that you could do to gain XP. So cutthroats, when they backstab, steal, and disarm stuff. Illusionists, when they entertain crowds and do tricks. Plague doctors, when they cure disease, rescue villages. Soldiers, when they kill strong enemies. And swashbucklers, when dueling. So you get XP for acting like your character. Yeah. Yeah, I love Perfect. that. It's, yeah. it's a great way to bring a narrative into a very light system. You're, play, you're playing um, this role, play the role, you know? Yeah. When it, and and it feeds into mechanically your primary stat will be the stat that you use the most per character. Absolutely, um, which is great. Um, when advancing to a higher level, PCs may try to raise one ability of their choice by beating its current value on a D20 roll, um, and one of their special abilities is automatically boosted. So in order to get higher, you have to when you're ready to try to advance, you get one shot, and if you roll higher, it goes up by one. Otherwise, you're fucked. So um, there are uh, reputation rules. So reputation is measured through a value from 1 to 12. PC start at 6. Value represents an ordinary person that haven't done good or bad things. Um, whenever you do a virtuous deed, you increase the score by 1. When you do bad stuff, it goes down. So virtuous stuff is like rescuing someone, saving a village, slaying a witch, that kind of crap. Um, vicious stuff is killing innocent folk, deceiving the authorities, theft and robbery, desecrating tombs. So if the reputation, if the reputation reaches 12, the PC is considered famous. And famous PCs are expected to solve social glitches, do heroic things, and blah, blah, blah. But you have no anonymity. And if the PCs ever reach one, you are infamous. Um, you'll be persecuted by authorities and are constantly held accountable um, when things go south. Um, from the moment a PC is famous or infamous, all subsequent actions are rewarded with a famous or infamous token. Um, PCs can hold as much as two tokens at once and spend them to gain certain benefits. So you could spend um, famous tokens to have free lodging, um, to uh, to get a referral by a local priest, to hire a retainer for free, to receive an exotic nift and a gift, and infamous tokens um, let you reach out to the underworld for rumors, receive help from a dark cult, um, instill fear in your adversaries, uh, rival loses the gambling on purpose. So things to consider: once famous or infamous, PCs only stop being seen as such when returning to six. However. They only gain tokens if their reputation stays at one or twelve. Reputation points should only be given once per session. So if you to keep your tokens, you have to stay high or low. And what's interesting is there are bonuses either way. Yeah. So you really could pick which direction you go. Um, 
commerce. It's really interesting how light the system is, but how much they tack on to it for campaign play. Yeah. Because we're we're only 16 pages into the book that is 40 pages long. Um, but we've already gone over all of the core mechanics. So Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you can play the game with just what you know now, and this is just yeah. the additional stuff if you want to enhance the experience, you know? Yeah. So we're just breezing through this stuff right now. You guys can check it out more if you want. This is on Drive Through RPG. But there's currency. It's a silver standard. If you're going to have currency, I love that there's a silver standard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, better than gold because it makes no sense. Um, uh, there's trading that you can do uh, when you enter a new town. You can a GM rolls on a table to determine what kind of market there is. So there's um, uh, situations and prices. So in war, prices are tripled. and plague, prices are doubled. Things like that. Abundance, it's halved. Um, equipment um, in general is an indication of how prices should be calculated. So there's a list of common goods here um, and all of the usage for it. So ammunition, D12, lanterns, lodging, things like that. They're all, everything's usage dice, which I love so much fucking better than um, just a list of goods. Yeah, um, absolutely. I hate that. Rare goods are 2D10 times 5 SP. Um, oh, uh, and common goods are 1D10 SP. Um, so that's just, that's, so yeah, and you just roll dice. Um, records are 2d10, exotic goods are 40, 10 times 10 SP. So, um, that's chemical hourglass. Yeah, basically and jewelry, just brackets like in between like common, rare goods and exotic goods. That's it. Um, there are pets you can have. Um, there's common, rare and exotic pets. There's values listed. Common pets are dogs and cats and rats. Rare are hawks and octopuses. Exotics are like monkeys and parrots. Um, you can train your pets. Parrots. Yeah, monkey parrots together, like the flying monkeys from, um, you know, the thing with the wheelies. Yeah, Fucking absolutely. terrifying. Star Wars. Um, yeah. yeah, Star Wars. You can train your stuff, like you can train your octopus to have advantage on finding secret doors. Makes it's sense. a very interesting, it's a, it's a, it's like most of a column for about training pets. Again, it's really interesting. The system is like four pages long and then there's whole pages on training pets. Um, there are ways to get retainers. The retainer depends on the rarity and the expertise. Um, if put in harm's way, the hire must make a charisma test for the retainer to stay. And each retainer has 4 HP and no armor. Um, the only exception is a mercenary that has 6 HP. So there's common, rare, and exotic retainers, including armors, carriers, mushroom pickers for common. Rare is hunters and mercs. Um, exotic are like alchemists, physicians, and things like that. So there's a list of tables with their talents, like scholars that read languages. Um, and hunters, they give advantage when hunting. Um, there's a whole page on alcohol and drugs, so you can ingest these things. Um, whenever you do, PCs must succeed on a strength test, otherwise they get wasted and must roll on the table below. The effect can be both good or bad. Um, drugs work differently. PCs make a strength test. If they succeed, they gain the benefit described. If they fail, they get the respective penalty. An intelligence test is allowed to determine whether the PC knows beforehand um, what it will do to them. So there's a whole list of beverages. Um, you can actually roll... Um, I would roll 2d10 on this because there's a list of there's yeah, two, tables. two names. It's the first yeah. and the second. So you could roll um, a seven and a one and get lucky absinthe. Or you could roll a three and an eight and get dry rum. You know, it's cool. Um, the getting wasted effects. Um, 12, you're, the PC has a permanent nipple or penile erection for four hours. Hell yeah. Get them hard nips. Um, and um, the low is you have disadvantage on uh, dex tests until the long rest is made. So uh, D12 table for getting wasted. Um, and then there's a list of samples of drugs. Um, a lot of them like mandrake root, valerian. There's things you've kind of seen before. Dead man's fingers. Um, cocoa leaves. Uh, do not need to eat or sleep for three days. Makes sense. Um, and if you fail, you must eat double rations and sleep for 12 hours. So there's real laudanum is an interesting one. Um, uh, you feel no pain and uh, cut all damage received in half for one day. But if you fail, you must take another drug in the next day or commit suicide. Interesting. Hell yeah. Dark. Yeah. Yep. Um, diseases. There's a whole page for diseases. Now, there's, there's a, a risk of for disease and like, you know, for everything. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy how like light this is until it's dense. Like yeah. the actual additions onto this are way denser than the actual rules for this game. Yes, you know? oh, unquestionably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all the campaign section, but so basically, um, you you can roll for diseases and roll for deadliness um, from three to six, being mild uh, to very deadly. Um, you know, and there's 
tests that you can do for it. But there's the Black Death, Chicken Pox, Dungeon Fever, Leprosy, River Blindness. They're pretty long too. It's like a paragraph of, of things. So, you know, if you if you get the Black Death, you get um, you know, uh Buos in the armpit, neck or groin with ooze and pus coming out. You have disadvantage on all your rolls to your main ability. Um, you lose two hit points every eight hours, and you're unable to heal or take a short rest. So you're fucked. You're dying. Yeah. Um, you're whole the, table, the, yeah. the black death will kill you, shockingly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, most people don't survive. Um, a whole a whole table for poison. Um, so there's uh aqua to fauna, there's belladonna, deadly nightshade. Um, you know, uh Belladonna, you become immobilized except for your eyes and face muscles. Um, there are antidotes, so you can um, see what the antidote, uh, what to do. Um, the antidote the could be have a sexual encounter. One is the best, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, eat someone's heart could be an antidote for disease or for, for the yeah. poisons. So it's really, really, really cool there. Um, a red page. There's a whole uh, section here. I like this because Don Quixote of La Mancha really... To me, fits a vibe perfectly. As, as soon as I see this, I almost wish this was earlier because it could be like, oh, I, I see exactly right. what you mean by 17th century. So um, I'm not going to read out the whole thing. If you haven't re ever read Don Quixote in your life, you should. Um, I haven't. So then you get into. You've never read Don Quixote? Mm -mm, no. Oh, you should. I mean, it's free online. Um, Sorry. So um, then we get into character classes. So um, let's just let's just go through one. Um, Let's see. You do Plague Doctor. Yeah, fuck yeah. I think it's so, closer to the bottom. Yeah, because there's a bag of tricks. Here's a Plague Doctor. So, um, it's you get two pages. One is the explanation, and the second page is the character sheet. Um, so going through the Plague Doctor, you get uh, this feels very. First of all, the the font's definitely I am fell. Um, yeah. but, uh, this feels like a little 5e in the way that it's written out, which is based on all D&D, which is whatever. But like, so you get max hit points, which are eight. Um, if you compare that to just for a quick comparison, compare that to the, like the fighter, um, the soldier, they have a max hit points of 12. 12 so don't forget yeah. your, 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 your scores don't ever go up. So you're just stuck with eight as a plague doctor. Um, your main ability is intelligence. Your weapon of choice are blunt weapons. Your armor is uh, cloth, leather, or cuirass. So it, it has a cleric -y feel to it. Um, you get D6 in instant background. Do you want to roll 1D6 real quick? Oh, um, uh, yeah. Two. Uh, you are a retired, a retired monk. monk. Yeah. You can Just also like been in a real life. Yeah. You could also have been a vermin collector or a survivor of leprosy. Interesting. Um, starting equipment, um, you start with an herbal and vermin kit, uh, which are D10, a plague doctor outfit, which counts as cloth armor, a wand with an hourglass, which is a medium weapon, um, and a small crossbow and arrows and three to 10 silver. You are studious. You have, you are not at disadvantage when determining if you're proficient in exotic languages, um, and, uh, have normal disadvantage, um, not double in dead languages. So you're smart boy. Disease and fear, you are immune to diseases as long as you're wearing your outfit. Um, which of course is the beak mask and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Um the beak must be replenished with its herbs and fragrances every two days by rolling an herbal kit usage die. In addition, the plague doctor rolls with advantage when poisoned to counter its effect. Um and finally you instill fear and any charisma rolls done against you are made with disadvantage. So keep keep your nose stuffed, uh, and you're a creepy boy. So sanitizing, plague doctors have advantage when fighting off vermin, um, uh, diseased humans or contaminated animals, um, you know their weaknesses, and doing treatments, plague doctors know all treatments at the current level and below. Before performing a treatment, plague doctors must succeed on an int check. Um, if failed, not only is the entire action wasted, but your urban vermin kit is immediately downgraded by one step, representing a lack of focus and bad, rep bad preparation of the medicine. Um, after performing treatment, uh, you roll your herbal and vermin kit usage die as a regular consumable. If the kit is depleted, um, you are unable to do any treatments until a new one is obtained. Um, you can try to hunt and forage for herbs and mice in the wilds, following the same rules as normal. Um, and you can only attempt this once in a certain area. Um, you can gain when you gain new levels, you gain access to new treatments and may try to raise one ability score. And extra uh, experience points can be gained from rescuing a village from plague, curing disease, and discovering new flora uh, and similar. So uh, the character sheet, super simple, really straightforward. Very, very I love, simple. I love how much they put um, on the page already. Like the ar like their armor, main weapons listed. Your inventory goes up to sixteen. Your special abilities are already written directly on it, um, and uh, your level advancement is marked off. 
Um, so you can actually like tick boxes. I love seeing this. Um, and your reputation is listed underneath. Cool picture of the Plague Doctor. Um, and there is, are five treatments, uh, five sections of treatments that you can do for each other level. So at level one, you can send rats at people. You can apply leeches. Um, you can detect disease. And you can purify water. Um, gives you more of that cleric feel. Um, Skip but all, all the way, up, way down to level five, baby. The first yeah, one, level oh, yeah. five. Yeah, raise, raise, raise dead. dead. There's no uh, magic in this system. There is no magic. Dead. It's miraculous cures. You know, it's yep. like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you return and will like target back to life. Like less than 40 hours dead, but you can just bring yep. something back. Um, you can also cause lice infestation. You can counter you can death. Counter death. You know, you can avoid your own death by disease, drugs, or poisons, and return a max hit points. Um, and you can mass heal. Um, so it's definitely the cleric vibe reskin, but that's totally fine. I love it. I'm that's fine fantastic. with that. That's okay with me. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's again, all five of the classes have their own character sheet. There is another very long page from uh, Don Quixote. Again, since there are two of them, I wish there was one like right in the beginning, um, but um, it is what it is. Um, tip corner. Um, this is a, a quick section on some tips um, for the for the system. Um, for hit points, as mentioned, and the system, the hit points are static. They do not increase. Um, it's one of the main differences uh, versus other systems. Um, it doesn't mean the PCs are going to die around every corner. Um, many of them have tokens, healing capabilities, tricks. Um, again, and uh, you don't often die when you hit zero. You have to roll a six or have a TPK. So um, it, it's brutal. You go down a lot, but it, you won't die. What's it up? I can't remember the other game that we talked about that. Where like, oh, uh, Frontier Scum. Um, mm. You you will hit zero a bunch, but the odds of yeah, dying you, yeah, when you really absolutely. look at it are, are better than you think they are. Um, there's uh, tips on damage. There's tips on skill rolls. And there's, there's a tips lot of on... conversion. There's a direct converting yeah. AC in the next section, but all these um, also reference like converting from other OSR games into this one. Uh, yeah, which which would be hard. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of the a lot of the the mechanics that are added in things like the inventory rules and things like that don't really matter. But converting AC, converting monsters is pretty i mean it's a d20 system so a lot of it's just going to drop over so it's not hard um to do that um and that's that's it and they have a, a why this game section which uh, i believe would be the back of the the zine which again god if you i if i want one if you have one yeah. and you're willing to get rid of it you let me know because i would love to snatch up one of these real bad um i i feel like i have no idea when this came out but it was on Exalted. It was on Games of Nivorous. It must have been a long time ago. Yeah, I, don't... I vaguely remember seeing it. But yeah, it's, yeah. I, it's neither of us. Neither of us on the physical copy. No, which which makes me uh, I'm going to put it on my list. I ha I do have a, a growing grail list of things that I need to have. Uh, Civid Sanctum in our chat actually helped me out with uh, with uh, some of the stuff from that by giving me one of the uh, original original um uh setting sound ones that he had but the game looks fantastic i mean i i think it's really cool um i think that uh i love i know this is really weird i love the color blue on the front and back page hell yeah i don't know why but Speak i would love truth, it. brother yeah and the paper texture it has a texture to it that reminds me of the lfos are paper a little bit so it really it really mm. gets me a little bit yeah uh, do you do you feel like this is a game that's big enough for a scoring no i, I don't I think don't. so either yeah you know? no. I think I really no. the thing I really like about it is I like that it's a historical NSR, um, yeah. and I like that it's actually very very lightweight, but then gives you a ton of uh, fucking. He's like, hey, you want to add all the, the, for the campaigning section? The campaigning section is massive, you know, compared to the yeah. rest of it. You know? Compared to the rest of it, yeah. But I mean, like you just said, as a system, so light, it would take two seconds to get up and running with this. And it really I love. Would. I love how brutal it feels, but. At the end of the day, you're probably not, unless you TPK, you're not going to lose a ton of characters, but your characters are going to get hurt and maimed and continue on. Yeah, and I you know, that. how often do you actually TPK when you're playing a game? You know, how, yes. how often does that does that happen? I don't know. Hey, uh, John Davis. Hey, how John. Often do you TPK? <laughs> hey, fucking John. Hey, <laughs> hey, fucking Civid Sanctum over here. How often do you TPK people on their stream? Uh, um, but anyway, yeah, so. Yeah. That I was 17th century minimalist. It was, it's yeah. good. It's lightweight where it needs to be and gives you a little bit more girth where you want it. Um, yeah. 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 
I mean, there's not much more to say than that. I really fucking enjoy this. I loved playing an adventure of this. Clusterfuck in the little that we got to play before Don killed us all um, was a super fun, interesting adventure. It was really well written to just be like, exactly what it what it probably was meant to be is as soon as you're like oh shit we're fucked how do i figure this out okay i kind of might have this figured out boom door opens and someone else comes in boom yeah, door opens totally. and someone else comes in um, what, like, and again, really, like i really could just cool. see some like alternate history or some weird shit going yeah. this and that being a lot yeah. so i i want to play this lot i mean i i do have plans probably starting in January to start up a stream called side quests where I run a lot of these very light OSR NSR games like Cairn and Nave tunnel goons, all those kind of things. Um, this is a perfect one to add to that. That's like a one to three sessions tops with a really cool, really light system that you can do a zero session and play, um, in the very first sitting. So this is definitely going to be added to that. But again, hey. um, as Hunter just said, um, that is 17th Century Minimalist, and that is our episode for today. It's a little bit shorter, um, but I have to work. Hunter has to go to sleep. Um, we are the Weekly Scroll, uh, brought to you by The Adventure Archive. Um, you can find us on Instagram at the.weekly.scroll. And again, I say this every week. I promise I will start catching up on that. Um, we are weekly underscore scroll on Twitter while it still lasts. We are The Adventure Archive on YouTube. Do us a huge favor. Um, go over to YouTube, subscribe to that. We're growing steadily over yeah. there. And we really, really appreciate that. Um, and now uh, we are up and going on Mastodon, where you'll find us just at the weekly scroll at dice.camp. Um, so I'll add that to the uh, the socials here at some point. Um, and that's it. That's our episode. Hunter, it has been wonderful. This was super fun. Um, we will figure out what we're going to do next week before Friday. Um, and, uh, Probably. we know, we know what we're doing next yeah, week. We do know what we're doing next week, actually. So a uh, uh, quick announcement for what that is. We are actually going to have rookie jet studio on the show. Which uh, I'm rookie. fucking stoked for. Um, so excited. This will be our third game we're reviewing from them, which is yeah. the most from any person we've done on the show. <laughs> also the fact that we've only been around for a little bit over a year and we have, and they've put out games and they're good. Out. They're yeah, good they're, games. So very anime based, which I mean, I'm rocking mob psycho shirt right now so you know we're into that um, but empty cycle um is a game that we're doing it recently came out you can find it everywhere um it is very fully cooly based which if you haven't seen fully cooly i if you haven't i would it, fuck the first, you <laughs> if you haven't seen, seen it, it fuck right? you you yeah no, seen that's, 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 i of course i've seen it i'm saying okay. you haven't seen it i know i'm saying you. yeah fuck you could do it but i was saying if the with your face i wasn't sure if it was just like oh yeah i haven't read don quixote um but uh, anyway, no, Empty Cycle next Friday, 6 p.m. Rookie Jet Studio is going to be on the show. We're going to chat about anime. We're going to chat about um, Empty Cycle. Then we're going to review Empty Cycle afterwards. Um, and as far as I know, do we want to talk about what's happening on Saturday? Is that a confirmed plan? As far as I know, it is. I think it's our confirmed plan as far as I know. So. Next Saturday um, next at 6 Saturday. p.m. Oh, that's we right. Are, yeah, we are actually going to have um, episode three of Creator Cuts. Um, much like episode one, we are bringing back Micah Anderson, um, and he is going to be running, or they are going to be running, uh, Batrachian Swamps, written by himself, and uh. written by them, and, uh, Nature May, um, but running it with Bastards. Last time he was on, he ran, uh, his, that rec they ran Troika. their, um, Hex Drive setting for Troika, so this time, they're going to be running, uh, Batrachian Swamps and Bastards. Super excited for that. Already told you my socials. That's the end of our episode. You guys all have a wonderful night. Bye! Bye!